As human beings, we strive to establish for ourselves a purpose, a meaning in life. Some of us find it in our careers, some in our families, and some of us find our purpose within ourselves. And this journey of purpose discovery is our attempt at defining our personal relationship with this world. It's a funny thing to try to define what it means to be a human being and what it is that makes us human beings instead of a walrus, for example, or a mountain or an oak tree. There have been many explanations offered as to what makes us different. Some say it's because we have the capacity for reason, while others say it's due to our capacity for empathy. Still, there are many who proclaim that what makes us human beings different is that we have a spirit. The Bible says that we were made in the image of God and that our creation contains a structure similar to his own. That is, just as our God is a trinity, he is Father, Son, and Spirit, we too have been created with three key elements, mind, body, and spirit. Scripture in 1 Thessalonians 5.23 describes man's trinity as spirit and soul and body. Note the word soul here can be translated as mind or heart. Now most scholars agree that Apostle Paul is the author of this book and that in this particular verse, he is actually describing the sanctification process as being all-encompassing, that is, to involve our entire being, our spirit, our soul, and our body. Sanctification is the process of becoming holy, more specifically, becoming like Christ, a process which occurs over time and while our spirit is in communion with the Holy Spirit. In fact, in the early days of creation, when God created Adam and Eve, they existed in perfect communion with him, walking with God in the Garden of Eden. So much so that the process of sanctification for them would have been quite foreign. In this garden, Adam and Eve were given dominion and told it was all theirs, apart from one tree, of which they were not to eat or that they would die. The devil, in the form of a serpent, came to Eve and convinced her that eating fruit from the tree would not kill them. And this led to the two of them disobeying God and eating fruit from this tree. In reality, it did kill them, just not physically. Adam and Eve were cut off from their connection with God and cast out of the garden, and their spirits were no longer in communion with his own. This is referred to as the fall of man, and from that day to this, man has been separated from God and his spirit out of communion with God's spirit. In Genesis 3, we read of God's response to their disobedience. Specifically, we see that God describes the earth, all of creation, as now cursed, saying in verses 17 and 18, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. This curse, this fall, would impact all successive generations. This fall is considered the curse of sin. For it was through the disobedience of Adam and Eve that sin entered this world. Through sin, death also entered. And not long after being cast from the garden, Adam and Eve's son Cain murdered his own brother, Abel, bringing death upon them. The death that entered the world at this time, however, was more than physical. It was a spiritual death also, which means being separated from God. The rest of the Old Testament tells the story of God's people being brought back to him through relationship. However, there was always a middle man, so to speak, between the people and God. And initially this was Moses, but there were others, and eventually the judges and the prophets served in this role. And through these men, the people heard God and responded to him. When Jesus, the Son of God, came to earth, died, and rose to life again, he overcame death. And in so doing, he overcame sin. He then became the ultimate sacrifice and mediator, the middleman, through whom all can come to God. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Scripture tells us in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the one heart believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. And therefore, if we believe and accept that Jesus is who Scripture tells us he is, then we too can share in his victory and come into communion once again with God. 
although this is fantastic and freeing news, we still live in a post-fall world. The hope that we have in Christ not only helps us to steer our way through it, but even better, it is the salvation and victory over death that he gives, meaning that we will live with him in eternity. As John 3.16 reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but will have eternal life. Jesus is the only true source of peace and joy in this life and the next. And he is the only way to be in communion with God and to share in the victory. And this is very important. Let's take a look at the author of Ecclesiastes, which most scholars agree was written by Solomon. He begins by highlighting the insatiable appetite of creation. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Solomon continues on by saying that he was the greatest ruler in all of Jerusalem, having attained more wealth and power and wisdom than anyone before him. He says that he strove to obtain all joy and wisdom, that he has seen everything under the sun. And behold, all of it was vanity and a striving after the wind. Initially, it would seem as if this idea of all things being vanity is in opposition to the hope and joy that Christ provides. Still, the author of Ecclesiastes ultimately concludes that all things under the sun are vanity. Now, Adam and Eve were the first to fall into the trap of believing that knowing more and to have more would lead them to feel complete, and that communion with God was not enough. This temptation to eat from the tree was so great because the serpent told them lies by saying they would become wise in their own eyes and would be opened, and that they would become like God. They believed that it would make them even more content and happy and satisfied if they ate from the tree. But as we have seen, that did not happen. Their desire for the fruit and for the knowledge that it represented was greater than their desire for communion and relationship with God. But it led them to a fate worse than they could have ever imagined. For it led them to being spiritually cut off from God the Father. In returning to Ecclesiastes, we start to see how the talk of vanity begins to make sense. Solomon was wiser than all who went before him. He experienced everything and denied himself no pleasure. But did this wisdom bring him what he was searching for? Was he fulfilled by his wisdom and riches and pleasure? Plainly, he was not. He concludes, and rightfully so, that all of his seeking was in vain. It did not lead to gain or everlasting happiness and fulfillment. He found it vanity. Unfortunately, the temptation that Adam and Eve faced and Solomon investigated is still very much a temptation for each of us today. I would even say that this temptation is more alive and real today than in times gone by. For our society today is built on the very things that the author of Ecclesiastes warns us against. Our world tells us that we need to become successful in every area of life, that once successful, we will be fulfilled and life will be complete and we can then sit back and enjoy our success. We are even given end goals. We're told that we need to get a good education and that without one, we cannot achieve anything. We need to make lots of money to buy the best houses and to be secure. We need to marry the perfect person and then have the perfect children. We need to travel the world and experience that it, all that it has to offer. We need to achieve the perfect body. And finally, we're told that until we have achieved all of these things, that we will not be fulfilled, happy, or satisfied, and worse yet, that we wouldn't be worthy. Even Christians can fall into this trap. Although God tells us to be in the world and not of it, it is so easy to slip into what culture around us is telling us. Things like, your relationship with God is not good enough. You are not worthy of God's love because you have sinned. You haven't read your Bible today. You didn't pray today. You haven't prayed every morning this week. Even in the Christian world, we can be plagued with feelings of needing to have more and to do more or to be more or what we need to have like more expensive clothes or to be like the famous preachers that we see that needs to be cool and funny. But the truth is, and it always has been, our fulfillment, our completeness, our everlasting happiness and joy can only be found in God. 
the serpent, is still lying to people today. He is still whispering to you, trying to tempt you to eat the forbidden fruit, telling you that you need the new car. You need to be better, to know more, to be more successful, to become worthy, and to become like God. But the truth is, as the author of Ecclesiastes found out the hard way, the way that you achieve all is to fear God and to keep his commandments. Ecclesiastes 12.13 says, In fact, there is nothing more fulfilling than seeking after God. We read in Matthew 6.33, But seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The way that you can become more like God is not to eat the forbidden fruit, that is, by racing towards all the things that society tells you will fulfill you. Instead, you need to focus on becoming more like God by seeking out a relationship with him and by letting him lead you into the future that he already has planned for you. Now, does this mean that finding pleasure and achievement on this earth is bad? It does not. Why? Because God made this earth and he told us to seek pleasure in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We read in Psalm 118.24. He gave us the capacity to enjoy life. In fact, living life for God instead of living life reaching for what you do not have gives you the freedom to actually enjoy life. Once you recognize that true fulfillment and success can only come from your relationship with God, you can enjoy life no matter what circumstance you're in. You no longer have to see life as a ladder where each rung brings you closer to happiness and success, where you just have to keep climbing and struggling until you've reached the top. Sadly, when viewing life this way, aside from never truly reaching happiness, you cause yourself to compare yourself with others and to view life as a tool to happiness, which of course it can never be. Besides God telling us this and Ecclesiastes setting it out as true, Romans 12, 2 advises, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So, instead of wasting our time toiling each day, laboring and longing after something that is not real, we have the opportunity to take part in a very real and lasting happiness. As the psalmist states in Psalm 127, verse 2, it is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For he gives to his beloved sleep. You don't need to strive for peace and rest and fulfillment as the world tells you to. God wants to give it to you already and will give it to you if you accept it. A relationship with the one who created you is the only way to true joy, to lasting peace, and to a value and purpose in this life which is truly fulfilling. Your purpose and mine is to live in communion in relationship with our creator. And if you're not already doing that, Know for sure that he does desire to love you, to know you, and to teach you about himself. And with that, I urge you to allow yourself to let go of the pressures and the burdens of this world. Jesus tells us to trade our burden for his because his is easy and light. He will take our burdens for us if we let him. It may be hard to believe this, but truly this life can be far easier than you imagine. And no matter what circumstance we are in or where in the social strata we fall, we only need to turn to Jesus. I thank you so much for joining me today to listen to this week's message, and I hope that you are left with thoughts that engage you. Do take what you've heard to the Lord. He is there, ready and willing to listen and to show you his purpose for you, to help you find peace and joy. And I pray that you have a week that's great, and I hope that you'll join us again next week for another message from the Little Church World. Goodbye and God bless.